Now, Collins Dictionary chose permacrisis as the word for 2022. And everything from the invasion of Ukraine, the cost of living crisis, rising US-China tensions, I think it definitely captures the zeitgeist. But are these all unconnected events or are there deeper forces at play? And no, I'm not talking about some deep state conspiracy here. To help us get our heads around this, we have Professor Helen Thompson, who teaches at Politics and International Studies here at Cambridge. She's also the author of this book, Disorder, Hard Times for the 21st Century. So welcome, Helen. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Conrad. Um, Helen, if you could start by telling us a bit about how energy, you came to this realization that energy uh, plays such a huge role in the geopolitics of our age. Yeah, I think that I really started by going back to the beginning of the age of oil, which is the late 19th century and the early 20th century, and thinking about the geopolitical world that oil began to create. And the more that I thought about it, the more it seemed that I could run a story about the 20th century and in the to the 21st century geopolitically through that frame. I'm not trying to suggest that oil can explain everything in the geopolitical history since the beginning of the, the 20th century. But if we look at that point, we can see that there were two big oil producers in the world, the United States and Russia. And that it's not a coincidence, I think, that those two states, albeit in the form of the Soviet Union, in Russia's case, went on to dominate the 20th century geopolitically, obviously, particularly the United States. And this put the European states at a very big disadvantage because none of them, except Austria, had any oil. It was also clear by the beginning of the 20th century, though, that there was a pretty high probability that, of there being oil in the Middle East, particularly Persia, and then Mesopotamia as it then um, was. And this meant that the Middle East became a site of European imperial competition particularly, I would say, to begin with, between Britain and Germany. Britain became the winner of that. And in a way, that's the world of the 20th century. So you have two big producers who were independent states at the time when oil started to matter, and then a place that was subject to European empire and continued to be subject to European empire, not in the sense that Persians were colonised, but where the European powers were trying to be pivotal. And then I think what we can see is, is that world in one way or another lasts till the 1970s and then it's transformed because the United States stops being largely self-sufficient in oil. It now wants oil from the Middle East too. And what we see in the 70s is the imperial age in the Middle East comes to its final end with the withdrawal of Britain from east of Suez, as it was called, and the Arab states and eventually Iran decide they want to control those energy resources for themselves. So we have state-owned oil companies in the Middle East. And the world that we now live in is as complicated as it was in the 1970s with the added addition to the mix of China. Because China at that point in the 70s was obviously not an industrial economy. It was actually self-sufficient in oil um, itself. But as its economic growth took off in the 21st century, it became a large oil importing state, now the largest oil importer um, in the world. And it did so at a time when the United States became less dependent upon the Middle East because of the shale um, boom. So we're now living in a world in which we have three big oil producers, three big oil producers, the United States, Saudi Arabia and Russia, and two parts of the world, Europe and China, that have to grapple with significant foreign oil dependency and all the geopolitical complications that that produces. Thanks, first of all. Thanks, Helen. Um, just quickly to shout out to some of the people who are watching. So we've got Johnny, who is an alum of Judge Business School. He's in Lebanon. Hi, Johnny. Uh, Martin's from Toronto. Natasha, she's got a question for us later. And we've got Baba Tunde from Nigeria, Pavel, who uh, is on here quite often um, from Poland, Vicky from Taiwan again, and someone's watching us from Uganda.
Um, I wanted to say that we'll, as a special treat for our viewers today, we'll be giving away one signed copy of, Prof of Helen's book at the end of the live stream. And to enter, you just need to type hashtag disorder in the comments and we'll do a draw at the end of the show. So if you're going to do that, make sure that you turn off the anonymous setting in LinkedIn so we know who, who to contact. Um, coming back to this idea of geopolitical uh, tussle about for oil and energy, do you feel that this push towards renewables will help to rebalance some of that tussle? Not necessarily. Uh, for two reasons, really. First of all, I think that we can already see that the competition for oil is being replaced by the um, competition for metals and that China is in a very advantageous um, position in relation to that competition. And the United States uh, or the American political class is, I think, deeply concerned that in the way in which the age of oil was dominated by the United States, that the age of low carbon energy might be dominated, well be dominated by China. Having said that, I think because the energy transition is actually going to be slow and we're going to be living in a multiple energy source world for some time to come, that we're going to be living geopolitically in a world where the geopolitics of fossil fuels, particularly oil and gas, coexist with the geopolitics of low carbon energy, particularly around metals and rare earth. So in that sense, the world is going is becoming more geopolitically fraught than it was because we have multiple geopolitical contests around energy going on at the same time. We'll come back to this um, idea of China now being in ascendancy with its access to those rare earths and the materials needed for that clean energy transition. Um, but we have a couple of questions, one question here from Natasha. Uh, I don't know if you're, how much you're familiar, I'm not familiar with oil in Guyana, but I guess the question is, her question is, what about these new oil sources that are coming on stream or may come on stream? Again, how do these things change these geopolitical calculations and tussles between the US, China, Europe, and Russia? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't claim to know anything very particular about the Guyana case, but what I do think is that these parts of the world where oil production is starting to increase in what have been relatively small oil producing countries uh, so far are going to matter um, because there are some serious issues around the supply of oil at an affordable price for the world economy at the moment. And what we've seen is that largely conventional oil production, so that's non-shale, non-tar sands, stagnated from around 2005. And really the world economy got by in the 2010s by the American shale oil boom. Now the American shale oil boom is far from over, but the rate of growth is not going to replicate this decade what it did in the 2010s. And still quite a number of those um, conventional oil producers, including say a country like Venezuela or Nigeria for um, various reasons, geopolitically Iran's position, these are not in a position really to do much in terms of increasing output. So as the effect of shale wears off, and none of the larger OPEC plus oil producers can really compensate, then what have been these small, smaller oil producers like Guyana are really are, go are going to matter because the supply of oil has got to come from somewhere. Now, you can say as a counter argument to that, well, the demand for oil is going to fall quite rapidly, supposedly, because of the energy transition but I'm not really convinced that that is the case um, because in order to really change the amount of oil that's being produced, sorry, used um, just for transportation, we would have to see a really significant change in the uh, number of electric um, vehicles uh, on, the, on the road. 
and there isn't e there isn't evidence yet that that is taking um, place. So when people talk about renewables growing, they mean that in relation to electricity, and that's a completely different proposition decarbonizing the electricity sector than it is replacing oil in transportation by electrifying transportation. Mm. Natasha added that uh, Guyana has discovered oil and ExxonMobil uh, mm. is there, as is Russia chi and China. So mm. there we go. Uh, Helen, in your book, you, talk, you start off with energy and the role it plays in geopolitics. And then you move on to the world of finance and how from the, especially the US managed to become this world dominant currency as a result of the obviously the war but also uh, its position as an as, as a source of oil and energy can you explain how that happened and how the US is now so dominant the US dollar is so dominant yeah I, I, this is this this is a complicated story so clearly the United States had the dominant currency in the world um, through the entire post Second World War era. And that was entrenched in the Bretton Woods monetary um, system. And when the Bretton Woods monetary system broke down in the 1970s, rather than the dollar becoming less important to the world economy, I'd suggest it actually became even more important particularly perhaps because of the growth of the euro dollar markets and the way in which the dollar came to dominate international banking. And I don't think it's possible really to understand what happened in 2008, so the 2008 crash, without understanding the centrality of the euro dollar um, system um, to that. There was a desperate shortage in many other parts of the world for banks of dollars in 2008. And that meant that the United States Federal Central Bank, the Federal Reserve Board, had to provide those dollars. So if you look at the amount of credit that was provided by the Central American Central Bank during the 2008 crash, a really disproportionate amount of it went to European banks in one form or another. So I think what emerged after 2008 was that the Federal Reserve had become the lender of last resort to the euro dollar market so we're now in a world where the dollar not only is more important i think to the world economy than it was in the bretton woods era more important than it was between the 1970s and the 2008 crash and that has allowed um, the united states to exercise financial power in a way that i think is perhaps unprecedented and we can see that in the way in which the United States was able to, first under the Obama administration, later under the um, Trump and Bar um, Biden uh, administrations, able to weaponize the dollar in financial sanctions, whether that be against Iran in order to bring Iran to a nuclear deal under Obama, whether that be the financial sanctions that were placed on Russia um, uh, after the 24th of February um, last um, uh year. So whilst we live in a world in which American power is in decline in some ways, like say militarily in the Middle East, in other ways we live in a world in which quite possibly the United States has more financial power than it's ever had before. And central to that is the, the position of the dollar and its absolute centrality to international banking. Mm. Obviously, the other major superpowers don't won't take this line down. So, um, and I think the the U, this weaponization of the U.S. dollar, especially after the invasion of Ukraine, really drove home this the vulnerabilities that some that countries have uh, in the financial markets. So, do you think that, in a way, the U.S. is overreaching in terms of the use of dollar, the U.S. dollar in, term, in these sanctions, and are there alternative credible alternatives that are trying to emerge? I don't think there's any doubt at all that the way in which the Americans have exercised this financial power has strongly incentivized other states, not least the Chinese and China and Russia, 
to look for alternatives. And indeed, I think if you go back to the immediate years after the crash, you can see a real desire in among in the Chinese leadership uh, to internationalize the Chinese currency for that reason and to try to get round this problem that is haunted, I think, the Chinese leadership for some time of China needing to use the dollar in order to pay for energy imports, even if it's buying those energy imports, that oil and gas, say, oil from Saudi Arabia or from um, Russia. And I think in China's case, that the Chinese leadership was you know, very alarmed by the financial sanctions that were put on Russia after the invasion because they understood the same thing could be done to them in the event of a China-US war over Taiwan. Having said that, I think it's actually extremely difficult, however frustrated everybody is with the Americans, to get away from the dollar. And part of the reason, a good part of that reason, is because the dollar is so embedded in international um, banking. Um, and that so far as countries' banks, which include the Ch Chinese banks, are integrated in to that international banking structure and the way in which, for instance, repo markets work, it becomes very, very difficult um, to, to escape the dollar. And then on top of that, China's got the problem that it's not actually been able, willing, able or willing to do the things that would allow it to have an internationally desirable currency because it still has capital controls uh, and makes it not possible for the renminbi to be freely um, convertible. And ironically, I'd say that actually one of the reasons why China has had to maintain those um, capital um, controls is because in the post 2008 monetary and financial environment, it's very vulnerable to the Federal Reserve Board's decision making. We could see that when China had its financial crisis in 2015-16, is that you know that came about in significant part because the Fed was about to raise interest rates to about a quarter of a percent, or maybe it was still 0.5. Um, percent. So China has a very significant mon monetary vulnerability and financial vulnerability to Federal Reserve decision making. And that makes its financial position more precarious. That incentivizes carrying on with capital controls. That makes it harder for the yen renminbi to be an international currency. That gets you more stuck with the dollar. So it becomes a kind of vicious circle in that respect. Mm. Mm. I remember fondly the days of 0.5% interest rates yeah. <laughs> for my mortgage. <laughs> but we'll come back to the issue of uh, this whole US-China decoupling. But Roxana has this question about, will crypto help to get around these financial sanctions and weaken the US dollar dominance? Yeah, I mean, I've got... <laughs> I, again, I think that this is quite a hard question um, to uh, to think about. I suspect that the answer is no, though, again, I would say that the way in which the financial sanctions have worked have incentivized the desire elsewhere to use crypto um, for this um, purpose. But I suspect that anything that really emerges as a threat to American dominance in this respect will be met by a response in the same space from the American Federal Bank, sorry, the American Central um, Bank. So crypto is, is something that will be fought over, I think, by all the geopolitical players in the international and um, monetary um, sphere. It's not something that the American central bank is going to allow to be used to try to, to weaken American power in, in, in that in that respect. And I, I don't think it it's at the moment anyway um, anything that's going to change the centrality of the euro dollar system to the way the world economy works. Mm. I remember one of those crypto bros saying how Venezuela is one of the biggest users of crypto of, of Bitcoin. <laughs> Mm. Largely because they they just can't, uh, it's so expensive for them to access the U.S. dollar. So thanks very much, Roxana. Um, 
we also had a question from Abhishek. Uh, Abhishek's from India and he asked about renewables. Would hydrogen uh, be something that would help drive down the demand for fossil fuels and hence again tip the balance? Yeah, I think that if hydrogen um, were to do what its loudest proponents tell us that it can do, then this is a very clear uh, alternative to electrifying transportation. And I think that we should think about it in some sense that politicians and those who invest are going to be confronted by that choice um, in the next um, decade or so. At the moment, I think faith is being put in the electrification route for transportation rather than in the hydrogen um, route. Not that hydrogen is not significant, but that most of the emphasis seems to be on we will electrify transportation and electric vehicles uh, are the um, are the future. I think, though, as it becomes clearer how difficult that route is and just what the requirements for electricity um, are, particularly in parts of the world where uh, it's already the case that electricity is intermittent, essentially, then the hydrogen is going to become a, a more important part of the debate. But again, I think we'll still think there's quite a bit of wishful thinking about what hydrogen can do as a substitute for um, oil in transportation. There is nothing, I think, as an energy source that is going to compare with what oil could do in that respect, because oil is an extremely dense form um, of um, energy. Uh, it's easy um, to move um, about all the infrastructure in the world where transportation is concerned is pretty much set up around uh, oil um, at the moment. But in, in some sense, I think that we'll get be getting serious about the energy transition when these are the kind of specific debates that are happening, rather than these a priori assumptions that the, the energy transition can simply achieve a basically similar world economy with more growth for poorer countries and do it from a low carbon energy basis than rather than from a fossil fuel energy basis. I don't think the a priori assumption that it will succeed is right. It could or it couldn't, but it's going to be very hard, extraordinarily hard and the harder it gets the more i think these alternative possibilities of well what do we do with the, with transportation post oil will come to the fore you've mentioned a bit about how intertwined the us us and china are but obviously now people are, both sides are trying to decouple and they realize just how vulnerable they are to each other how practical do you think it is for the us and china to move to decouple well i think that the, 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 each of them faces diff, different difficulties in this um, respect is that in principle i think it's easier for china sorry it's easier for the united states to decouple if you just take the energy issue is it may be that the combination of um, the natural endowment of minerals and metals in the United States, once you actually start on a systematic effort to extract them, um, means that the United States can go much further than, say, any European country towards something like in the medium to long term, if not domestic self-sufficiency in metals, not having a huge foreign metal dependency. So in that sense, it's playing catch up with China with a chance of success or some chance of success. Uh, it may be that it's able to break up China's dominance of the supply chains in other parts of the world around metal um, extraction. I think it's quite difficult for China to break its fossil fuel dependency, particularly on gas, you know, in on the United States. So despite the 
decoupling rhetoric that's gone on over the last few years, China has actually been you know, increasing its imports or signing more contracts anyway with American shale gas um, companies. And China then has the vulnerability to for its oil imports from the Persian Gulf to an American naval blockade. So I think if you just look at it in terms of like, what are the prospects of like relative self-sufficiency for each of them on the energy and resource side? It's easier for the United States than it is for um, China. I think, you know, the, 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 the central difficulty or one central difficulty anyway is this issue um, of semiconductor chips and Taiwan's position in relation um, to this because it's not then direct dependency upon each other, but it's direct dependency on a country in which they're in conflict over. And what happens in a scenario for both of their economies if there is a war over uh, Taiwan? And that you could then say, well, what are the prospects for each of them being able to replicate what happens in Taiwan where high level semiconductor chips are maybe it's better in the united states and china i'm not uh, i i i i'm not so um sure and independently then of the the actual resource conflict issues and the taiwan semiconductor chip issue i think there's the question of well can either state and here i think it's particularly a question for the united states can they actually um put sufficient pressure on a company like Apple, say, in order to decouple. Because there's kind of assumption, I think, sometimes that the geopolitical decisions will get made in Washington and then all the corporations will have to jump into line with that. But I don't think that's really what we're seeing happening. And if you look mm. historically, uh, it's not what happened in relation uh, to, um, say, Franklin Roosevelt administration's you know, policies towards either Germany, Nazi Germany, or the, or the Soviet Union, um, mm -hmm. is that you know, corporate dependencies, corporate relations will endure through quite high level geopolitical confrontation. There will be a battle of political will between the governments and the, 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 the corporations. And so I think that whatever the aspiration for decoupling in the two capitals, is they're not just the players who are going to determine this question mm. at all. Helen Toyosi wants you to look into the future and tell us what you think is the prospects for the strength of the US dollar uh, looking forward, given what's happening with uh, the Fed and inflation mm. and recent bank failures. Yeah. I think we're seeing several things that are interesting here. The first of them is that the dollar has been relatively strong for the last few years and its strength has caused quite a number of countries, including some European countries at the time, I'd suggest Britain, for example, quite considerable macroeconomic um, difficulty. So if you go back to um, the fate of Liz Truss, you know, last autumn, one of the things that put so much pressure on her was that it looked like the pound was heading for parity against um, the dollar. So that we see that in an age or in an age when the Federal Reserve Board is determined to do monetary tightening for anti-inflationary um, reasons, uh, that any state with any kind of significant economic vulnerability will find that its currency is under considerable like downward pressure. And then if you move from a country like Britain to a country like Pakistan, uh, and you're confronted with having dollar debt, a rising dollar, rising interest rates, rising costs of energy imports, that's a pretty lethal combination. And then you're back really in, I'd say, the 1980s, the late 70s, 1980s, where uh, 
the Volcker shock led um, directly and indirectly to the developing country debt crisis of the 1980s. Simultaneously, I think there's something else going on, which is that it looks like the, the dollar and oil prices are now more often than not moving in the same direction. So for a long time, they were largely inversely related to each other. So oil prices went up and the dollar went down, the dollar went up and oil prices went down. You could see that like really clearly in um, 2000 and, uh, in 2014, um, when the dollar took off in the middle of the year and oil prices began a, a crash even before the Saudis decided to crash them further. But I think a world in which it's clear that the United States is um, a net energy exporter, which it is, I mean, it's still importing quite a bit of oil, but it's also exporting quite a bit of oil now, and it's exporting quite a lot of um, gas, that we should expect that that in itself is going to strengthen the dollar. And so when you add together the Fed as the most important central bank in the world on, for the moment, still a trajectory of raising interest rates, plus a, a US economy um, that is a net energy exporter and that that is taking the dollar up with it. That, I think, is a quite difficult world for economically, macroeconomically, for pretty much everybody else. And it's a lethal world for various uh, poorer countries with high debt, weak currency and strong foreign em import energy dependency. You mentioned trustnomics. And what do you think is the um, prospect for countries like, uh, other than the US, right, where uh, electorates maybe or politicians want to pursue a certain course of action? But in reality, they're bound by all these larger forces, whether that's energy dependence or the US dollar. Is there, is there really scope for sovereignty for countries other than the US or China? Yeah, I, think, I, 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 think that it's, I think it's very difficult. Um, uh, certainly um, on, the, on the macroeconomic side and within that on the, in the, with the monetary uh, side i i think you know there were probably various central banks in the world that probably wouldn't have wanted to raise interest rates even in relation to um the inflationary pressure that we've seen over the course of the last 18 months or so but were not able to resist monetary tightening when the fed went down the road that it did i know it was slow to get there but once it went down that road that sort of pushed others in the same direction. I mean, Japan has has been, I think, um, exception. Um, but I think there's some quite specific circumstances about um, Japan that means that you can't read off what Japan can do and what the Japanese Central Bank can do into what either the European Central Bank or the Bank of England uh, can, um, can do. I think that more generally, um, the real new development in this respect is the American Inflation Reduction Act, mm. because that is basically throwing the gauntlet down to everybody else. I'm, I'm not talking about China here, but European Union, Britain, um, Japan, as to you have to respond really to that because it's effectively saying that the Americans want American companies, American dominated supply chains to be at the center of the energy transition. And that non-American companies or in countries that haven't got a free trade agreement with the United States, so obviously the NAFTA, Canada and Mexico, um, have are going to be shut out of those supply chains and American markets in that respect. And whilst there's still sovereignty 
let's say, for the European Union in deciding what to do about that, how to respond to that. No one's going to say that some supranational claim to authority is going to override what the European Union decides to do collectively in response. It's still not got really very good options, um, not least in the European Union's case, because obviously the whole single market kind of pulls in the opposite direction to having a very subsidy driven industrial um, policy. So then that raises the question, well, does the single market have to be adapted to the move that the Americans have made with the Inflation mm. Reduction Act? So at the very least, it's, 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 it's very constrained autonomy, i.e. a mm. diminishment of autonomy. And that's uh, obviously a difficult sell for any politician to make to their electorate. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good time to look at Dan's question, which Dan asked, are you concerned about democratic def deficits and Western democracies being fit for purpose? Yeah, I mean, I spend some time in the last third of the book on the question of what's happened to democracies over the last 50 or 60 um, years and i think that western democracies have had certain things eroded since the 1970s i think that it's it's harder for some of them and particularly here i think the united states is exhibit a to maintain losers consent to the outcome of elections i think that was actually true in 2016 it was true in 2020 and it would be i think true again if trump or somebody like trump were to to win the election in 2024 and you can't actually have demo democratic government over any with any stability if those who lose elections don't consent to losing uh, elections i think if you look at france um there's a, a real democratic problem there because it looks like the way in which opposition is now expressed on France is in France is on the streets with a strong propensity to violence at the old party system where there's clear center right party clear center left party the socialists has broken down it's broken down really since, since Macron's victory in 2017 um, and it's it's not really clear what kind of contest France can have as a presidential election next time, given that. I think in Italy, um, the problem has been the, the dominance of technocratic politics and that what then happens is that the parties to the right that stay out of that technocratic politics move further and further to the right. Now, this time, I think there was sufficient awareness of what was going on that the politicians party, the Brothers of Italy, having won that the Brothers of Italy's leader was allowed to be prime minister, which hadn't been the case when the La Lega and Five Star formed the coalition government after the 2018 election. Um, but I, I don't think you can have over the long term democratic politics in Italy if it has such a strong bias towards technocratic um, to, towards technocratic um, politics. So I think there's lots of things to worry about about democracy. And I think that the energy transition will make some of these um, pressures on democratic politics in Western countries even more acute than they already are. I think this is a good time, Helen, to ask you, you know, um, are you optimistic about the state of global politics in the next 10, 20 years? Because uh, there's so many of these strong forces that are acting and there's all this instability. So is the next 10, 20 years, is, do you see causes for optimism? I think it's going to be a pretty rocky and difficult 10 or 20 um, years. Uh, I think that we don't know what the outcome of Russia's war against Ukraine is going to be. And until we do, it's difficult to see how European 
governments individually in Europe, the European Union as a whole can get to grips with what has changed in Europe as a result of the, the war. So, for instance, if Ukraine is indeed coming into the European Union, it is almost certainly going to have to have NATO membership in order to do that. And that is means that we're living in a very different geopolitically geopolitical Europe, even than the one that we've lived in through the last year. So since the, the war began, then there's the Taiwan question. It's whatever, wherever we're heading on that, whether we're heading for a war between China and the US over Taiwan or not, um, the possibility of war is going to hang over us in the Pacific, I think, for the next decade or so. Because one way or another, that Taiwan question is is going to be resolved and it could be resolved in a fairly brutal and horrible um, way. If it's not, that that's going to mean a transformation, I think, of the US-China relationship in a more benign way, um, which again would change the world again. Uh, so it would be in some sense now disruptive and then there's the energy transition, which, as I've suggested several times, I think is going to proceed quite slowly. It's going to intensify geopolitical competition over um, over metals, and that is going to bring to the fore uh, the profound tension between the desire in Western countries to tell developing countries what they should do about energy and the reality that governments and citizens in um, developing countries want to be able to use much, much more energy than they presently do because they simply do not have the reliable supplies of energy that we are used to, you know, we are used to um, here and they're not going to take lectures from Europeans and North Americans um, about uh, how they have to prioritise climate change over energy security when their energy security is so limited and i think that that's going to make things um pretty difficult if there's any grounds for optimism i would say it is that where energy is concerned at least that i think the levels of awareness now of the complexity of the energy situation the complexity of the energy um, transition, the way the different geopolitical problems in the world interact with each other and what the dangers are, I think that's quite a lot higher than it was even three years ago, certainly than it was seven or eight in the middle of the last um, decade. I, I think one of the strange things about the 2010s, particularly the second half of it, was that on the one hand, it was an age of shocks for many people anyway, Brexit, Trump, uh, alternative for Deutschland in in, in um, Germany, what happened in uh, Italy. But at the same time, that coexisted with quite a lot of complacency about the geopolitical world and the energy world and people not really understanding like how fraught that was. But I think that that complacency is, is over. I think whatever else has happened as a result of Russia's war, is all kinds of questions that were hard and being buried in some sense are now much closer to the political surface and although there are dangers in that particularly on the us china side there's actually it's, it's better i think for more people to have a higher awareness of geopolitical danger and energy danger than the complacency that prevailed before mm. and i think if people want to uh, get more well informed and not be so complacent you should really read your book and we've reached the end of the live stream where the only thing i have left to do is see who gets a signed copy of your book and it is martin martin buckland from toronto so uh, we'll get a signed copy of the book to you martin Thank you for joining us.
And thank you so much, uh, Helen, for sharing your thoughts about the geopolitical situation and giving us sort of uh, ideas about what we should be looking out for, uh, not just in our careers, but also in the businesses that we be running or working in. So thank you very much, Helen. And thank you to everybody who's been watching us today. Our next live stream is in two weeks' time, May 26, where we'll be talking about the circular economy. Till then, thank you very much and stay safe. Oh, 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 o